so welcome back everyone. So um, let's resume now. Let's, let's focus on what we've done in the first lecture. We've basically uh, derived the Josephson equations that govern uh, the motion of a Josephson equation, of a Josephson junction. And now what I would like to do uh, in the remaining time is to try to show you how this part here, which is non-universal, can be calculated, will change from one system to the other, from a conventional system to a topological system, and in the end, how experimentally we can probe uh, in a realistic system with realistic simulations, um, uh, how we can probe the, the difference between a conventional and a topological system. Okay, so we finished the lecture with uh, the topic of Andreev reflections, which uh, I tried to explain by saying that an electron which impedes uh, on, on the superconducting interface will be reflected as a whole and a Cooper pair will be emitted uh, in the superconductor. Now if you place two of these superconductors to form a Josephson junction, you will form some kind of cavity. And uh, as any cavity, uh, it will have resonant modes, except that here the boundary conditions on each of the mirrors are a bit special. They are given by the conditions that we uh, derived to, uh, that, that we uh, uh, saw together a few hours ago, and uh, they, they will give rise to special bound states which are called the Andreev bound states. And as you can see, the Andreev bound states uh, give the possibility to transfer Cooper pairs from one condensate to the other, so they will carry some uh, of the current through the junction, and actually in small mesoscopic system, they carry most of the supercurrent. Okay, so what I would like to do somehow is uh, to try to give you uh, a simple explanation on, of how one can calculate uh, those bound states. There are several methods, but there's one that is fairly easy to introduce, which is a scattering method. And I will just uh, then show you um, uh, somehow what, what you can calculate if you make simple assumptions in a topological case and in a conventional system. Okay, so one way to describe the system using scattering uh, uh, matrix theory is simply to say that uh, whatever you have at the center can be seen as a scatterer for which you have scattering matrices that will tell you how uh, an electron can be reflected as an electron or uh, can be transmitted and so on and so forth. You have many combinations. This will describe under this uh, scattering matrix the normal part. And here you will have uh, the boundary conditions given by the Andreev reflection. And now what you're looking uh, for is, are, are the resonance states. So you, you look for some kind of resonance conditions. And what you want is basically that uh, an electron here, which is reflected, uh, on, uh, which, which scatters first in a normal region, then is reflected as a, a whole uh, by the Andreev reflection, then scattered as a whole in the scatterer, and comes back after a second Andreev reflection at the initial point, you want that this trajectory is actually a stationary trajectory so that it picks up a phase that is a multiple integer of 2 pi and things like this. And the best way to write that is simply to, to, uh, um, to convert what I've just told you in a mathematical equation where you just say that somehow you first scatter uh, as an electron in the normal part, you Andreev reflected, you scatter as an electron in, uh, as a whole in the normal part, and you're again, once more, um, uh, Andreev reflected. And you want to have to find non-trivial solutions to that equations. And that's a very simple way uh, to, to calculate the Andreev bound states in a system where you can describe the normal region only as uh, a scatterer. Now we'll make some assumptions which are uh, commonly made just to discuss globally the physics and you will see, that, uh, I will just show you what are the important points that do not depend so much on these assumptions and what are uh, the things that may depend on, uh, on the assumptions. Okay, so first, the first example I, I want to give you is the case that you obtain from uh, a conventional system. If you remember here, uh, the, the thing we wrote about on real reflection is that there is a phase shift at the interface which is given by phi I, which is the uh, phase of the superconductor on which you're reflecting, plus a second term which is 
the arc cos of E over delta, where E is the uh, energy at which you're impeding on the interface. Now, if you assume that the scatterer is trivial, it's short, but there's not even scattering, it's perfectly transmitting, and, and there's no accumu accumulated phase, then you can see that you will pick up this phase on the first, at the first reflection, then you will pick up a similar phase, but with opposite signs when you reflect on the opposite, uh, uh, on the second superconductor, and naturally what you will do in the end is that if you solve this equation and you want the phase to be a multiple integer of 2 pi, you will end up with something which is phi uh, plus or minus, it doesn't really matter, r cos of e over delta, and there should be a 2 here because you pick this phase twice, equals 0 modulo 2 pi. And if you do that, this gives you something like this. Okay, and this gives you a family of bound states, so there are plus and minus signs, you have different combinations, but this gives you this type of bound states here, which is the blue one. And uh, you can see several things. First, it has a crossing at the center at zero energy, and also it goes all the way uh, to the continuum here, which I represented here by this uh, gray zone over here. Um, now, one thing that happens in this in, in the conventional system is that this crossing is absolutely, uh, as in my, uh, to, to my knowledge, never been really seen. You can get pretty close to it, but never you can never see this crossing. And the reason is that as soon as you have some very very small scattering, it's already enough to open a gap near uh, zero energy. So you will typically uh, end up with uh, whatever. Um, the scattering can be, you will end up with typically bound states that will look like the red lines. And depending on, on, the, on, on, the, on the transmission of, of the central region, you may end up very close to zero energy or a bit further. Um, this is a generic situation which you can describe with these generic on drive bound states uh, where D is the transmission. But what I want you to remember is that first, you always have uh, an avoided crossing around zero energy. And second, you always touch the continuum here. Now, this uh, avoided crossing at zero energy uh, um, is always the case for conventional bound states. But here, I, I've only shown one bound state. This is the case where the junction is very short. If the junction is much larger, you can see that as, as, a, as a square potential well. If you, if you uh, uh, increase the size of the well, then you get more and more states. And these states will, will fill up uh, the, the space between, uh, all the space between this guy and the continuum. So you may have different configuration. But what matters here is the fact that you have this avoided crossing here. Now, if you do this in, with the same assumption of a very short Josephson junction in the topological case, then you get that type of families. So you always see that for perfect transmission, you have exactly uh, the same kind of Andreev bound states, which spreads all across the gap and has exactly the same uh, uh, dispersion. But there's one difference. Um, as soon as you will put some scatterers in the system, what will happen is that the Andreev bound state will actually not open a gap here, but will decouple from the continuum. And um, you can see this guy here as uh, topologically protected crossing that, sig that, that signals the fact that there's, uh, there's a reminiscence of the Majorana bound states in the system because you can see this, uh, this Andreev bound state typically as the fact that on either side of your, of your junction you have S to N or S to TI interface, it will host a Majorana and you bring them together and because of this there's uh, there's these special Andreev bound states that come with a zero energy crossing. And the zero energy crossing does not uh, occur uh, randomly. It occurs at, phase, uh, at phase, uh, phi equal pi. And this phase phi equal pi corresponds to the fact that you have destructive, destructive interference in the system and the Majoranas don't see each other anymore. So they are somehow uh, um, uh, decoupled. They don't see each other anymore, so they go back to their initial energy, which is uh, uh, zero energy. One thing I forgot to mention is that in the previous case, since you've made no assumption on the spin, all those levels are spin degenerate. In that case here, you have 
uh, no spin degeneracy, uh, but for what I'm going to say later on, I'm, I'm, I don't think it, it matters that much. Okay? So, if I have to summarize this in two words, uh, there's always an avoided, an avoided crossing in the conventional case, and there should be a protected crossing uh, um, in the topological case. And what does it change? Well, it changes the whole overall periodicity of these bound states. Here you see these bound states are 2 pi periodic with the phase difference across the junction. While this one here, you will uh, go from this guy here all the way down, and you need 4 pi uh, to, to come back to your initial position. So these bound states are, uh, should give rise to a 4 pi periodicity in the Josephson equation. And I will try to show you uh, in the remaining time how we can actually try to probe this 4 pi periodicity as a signature, maybe not a smoking gun, but at least a signature of, of the topological superconductivity that should arise in this Josephson junction. Um, so for this, there's one more thing I need to tell you, which is how this equation here is changed. So I told you first that the first Josephson equation here cannot change. It's, it's given by fundamental laws of the quantum mechanics somehow, so it, it cannot be changed. But the other uh, equation which I gave was IS of phi is IC sin phi. I told you this depends on the coupling in the material. Now, now that we've derived this Andreev bound states, uh, I just want to give you the formula between uh, this critical current here and the Andreev bound states that we've just derived. And I'm not going to derive this formula. Uh, you can do this with a, a th th some kind of thermodynamical uh, uh, calculations or just simply by uh, recalling that the phase in, in quantum mechanics is always conjugate to something like a number of particles, so to a charge. And uh, if you derive it, then you get a current. So this gives you that, that uh, type of, uh, that, that part of the equation. And the second part is a population factor. And here I wrote it with an F, because at equilibrium it will look like Fermi Dirac distribution. In real life, since uh, you see that there's d phi dt, the phase may change, and this, uh, uh, this may be at, uh, in a non-equilibrium case, so this population factor should be seen as something more global than just a Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, okay, so now you see that the 2 pi periodicity of the Andreev bound states or the 4 pi periodicity of this Andreev bound state will, come, will, will be uh, propagated via this uh, derivative here into the current phase relation. And this will give rise to some, something called the fractional Josephson effect. Um, so what is it? First, if you take the simple case of um, um, a, a, um, a tunnel coupling, you get something which we derived as IC sine phi. And you see that if you plug these two equations together for a constant voltage V, then the phase will evolve linearly over time. And if you plug it in, this will give you IC sine 2 EVT over H bar, which is an oscillating current. So here you see that the, the Josephson uh, junction is something like very uh, unconventional element in your circuit. You apply a DC voltage, it converts it to an AC current. And, uh, and the frequency of this current is given by the voltage uh, that you put, that you apply across the junction. Now the funny thing is that if you now have a 4 pi periodicity in the system, this will give you something which is not sine phi, but something which should have uh, an harmonic looking like sine phi over 2. And this will turn the Josephson frequency naturally from fj to fj over 2. And this is what people have been uh, uh, looking at and, and trying to find for years, and this is what people call the fractional Josephson effect. And um, now, what I would like to do is to show you how uh, we've tried to do this, uh, try to detect this contribution in, in our system, and we can do this in two ways. First, if you apply a DC excitation, I told you that the DC voltage will be converted into an oscillating current. You have a Josephson junction, it emits. Uh, the, the, the typical frequency of this oscillating current, if you compute the numbers, will be in the gigahertz range. So you have something like, like a small component in which an oscillating current circulates. It will irradiate into free space as if you would have an antenna. So you just collect, you just try to collect, 
this, uh, the emission by this uh, unconventional antenna and you just try to uh, plug it into your spectrum analyzer and analyze the frequency. That's the first thing you can do that seems very simple. This is um, actually much simpler than we initially thought, but um, um, uh, I'll show you in a minute how we can do. The second thing you can do is, okay, you have an oscillating current in your system, you know it, now what you can do is send an extra external AC excitation in the system. And then you can see whether the frequency of these two excitations are, 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 um, are similar, or whether they are multiple or whether they are incommensurate. And depending on this, you will have some kinds of beatings between the uh, external excitation and the internal oscillations of the current. And this gives rise to the so-called Shapiro steps, which is an effect which is known also uh, since uh, the 60s or something like this. Um, and I'll show you that if you realize this, then you can see uh, hints of this 4 pi periodicity also. Okay, so um, just a few, um, th there are a few tricks in that. This would, this would uh, be a sketch of something like our Andreev bound state spectrum where we look for something which has crossing at, at zero energy. But the thing is that your system is never perfect. Uh, we tried very hard to go to, to this ideal case, but it never works. You always have uh, a few problems. One of them is the fact that if your bulk is not perfectly insulating, or, um, um, and this is often the case because your, your contacts are very close to each other, so you can have percolate through disorder or something like this, you should not only have this 4 pi periodic state, but you, you may also have um, one or many of these two pi periodic states. So you have to distinguish between the two. The second thing is, um, if you try to set the phase at a constant value, and this is something you can do with squid techniques, I'm not going to enter into this, but if you would try to do that and, and just sweep very slowly the phase to try to reconstruct this Andreev bound state spectrum, then you would run into another problem, which is the fact that this is an excited branch and naturally, the excitation will try to relax to, uh, to the fundamental state. So in any case, to, to the ground state. So if you do it very slowly, you'll never see this excited branch, and you'll see something that looks like this, which would be 2 pi periodic, and you would not see a very big difference with the conventional system. Um, now there's one thing I don't want to really detail, which is the fact that some people have predicted that if you plug interactions, into the system, and if you have uh, a topological system, then you do not only get 4 pi periodicity, but 8 pi periodicity. And to be honest, I don't really understand the mechanism, but uh, we've never seen any trace. We've looked for that. We've never seen any trace of this 8 pi periodicity. So it's still an open question. Uh, finally, there's one thing that can also fool you, is the fact that if you have conventional states, like this one, but if the gap is very small, if you now, I told you, you cannot, do, uh, you cannot do this experiment with a phase that evolves very slowly. But if you do it too fast, then you run into another problem, which is the fact that uh, when the phase in, uh, uh, propagates here from 0 to 4 pi, then you can have non-adiabatic transitions between this state and the other one. And naturally, what you, what you can see in that case, what you can do is some kind of trajectory that would be 4 pi periodic. So if you do it too fast, then you run into the problem that you may have uh, a fake 4 pi periodicity that just comes from non-adiabaticity. So let's try to see whether we can distinguish all of that. Um, first, let me show you briefly a picture of, of, of our device. So what, what you have to do is to prepare a Josephson junction on, on a mercury telluride. So here you see uh, uh, the artist view that the mercury telluride is buried between uh, two protecting layers of, of cadmium mercury telluride. So you first need to remove a little bit uh, the top part, then you need to put the contacts here. The, so we use uh, niobium or aluminum, depending on, on, on the case, um, to induce by, via proximity effect some superconductivity below the contact. And then we add the top gate on top here to change the electron density in the junction so that we can hopefully go from uh, the conduction band to the valence band and see that in the gap there's something uh, uh, funny happening. Um, 
So if you believe my story, uh, there should be quantum spinal edge states circulating all around here, and especially here, so that the Majorana bound states or this gapless Andre bound state should be here and there. Okay, so let's measure a first sample. The first thing you see in the Josephson junction is the first thing you do is measure the IV curve. Uh, I told you there should be, we, so we derived together the fact that there should be a supercurrent, meaning a non -di uh, dissipationless current at zero voltage. And this is what you see here, where you have a finite current at zero voltage, and you, d you, you see that very clearly. But as you drive further and further away, um, you go into the normal state where you have an ohmic regime where the resistance of this line is given by the normal state resistance. Okay? Um, so this is very typical of a Josephson junction. Now you can identify from this data whether you're in the conduction band or in the valence band by plotting the value of this normal state resistance and the critical current as function of the gate voltage. And this is what's been done here, where you see that there are regions in which the critical current is very high and the normal state uh, resistance is very, is very uh, small. This means that you have a high, high electron density, so this will be typical of the valence band or the conduction band. In that case, this is positive gate voltage, so this is likely to be the conduction band. Then in that case, on, on that side here, you see that again, the resistance decreases, so this is uh, uh, potentially um, the, um, um, the valence band, and in between you have a maximum in the resistance. So this is where you would expect to see the gap, so the, uh, the, uh, the quantum spinal regime, and this is where you would expect to see uh, the, this topological superconductivity. Uh, in practice, you see that there are the sam samples are far from being perfect. The normal state resistance never goes to a quantized value, which would be 10 times higher than this one. And you never really go very frankly into the, the valence band, and this we attribute to the fact that uh, as I told you, the valence band is very, very flat, so it has a uh, um, high effective mass, low mobility, and because of this, the resistance uh, does not decrease very, very strongly. But still, we identify something like a maximum, so we expect to see the quantum spinal uh, regime there. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this part because it would take us too long. Now let's try to uh, see how we can measure the emission of, of uh, Josephson junction. So the technique that we use is very, very simple and is uh, a, somehow a refined way of measuring these things uh, if we compare to f very first experiments done in the 70s. So what you do is simply you take your Josephson junction, you have a circuit here with resistors and so on that enable you to apply uh, a constant voltage across the Josephson junction here. And what you do is that you use this uh, element here, which is a bias T. The bias T has a capacitor. The capacitor lets the RF signal go through, but uh, the DC signal is blocked, and the DC signal, in that case, goes to a voltage measurement. Okay? So this enables you to, to pick up the RF signal that circulates in, in this junction. You don't really know how it enters really in detail because it's electromagnetic mode at gigahertz frequency, you never really know whether it actually runs in the cable or whether it penetrates directly into your coaxial line. But at some point you pick up something and you send it to uh, an amplification line, which is in your fridge with a cryogenic amplifier, and you send everything to a spectrum analyzer. So you see that this is super simple as a setup. Uh, the only thing you do is amplify and, and put it in your spectrum analyzer. And now what you can do is first apply different uh, voltages and see whether at some point for, for your detection window, for a, detec a given detection frequency, you will detect emission. And then afterwards you can change the detection frequency. So this is what we've done and this is what it looks like. So first we, we took a narrow quantum well, one that is not topological. And if you do that, uh, beware, I've, I've reversed the axis. This is now the voltage and this is now the current. Here you see in red the IV uh, trace, where here you have the supercurrent, which is now vertical, and the voltage is on this axis. And now as I sweep the voltage, I see on the blue line, which is the RF amplitude, I see that 
for the, the detection frequency that I've chosen, I have one peak only for one positive voltage and one peak for the symmetric negative voltage. And this signals the Josephson emission. And if you compute from the numbers, you know exactly the voltage because you measure it, you know exactly at which frequency you're detecting it. You can see that in a trivial quantum well, the emission occurs at the Josephson, conventional Josephson frequency. Now if you do this with a um, topological quantum well, so slightly thicker quantum wells, which, is a, which should have an inverted gap, then you see that the emission features are, are quite different. Um, here you see that you have two peaks, but if you compute the numbers, they occur for uh, a voltage that corresponds to half of the Josephson frequency. So this is exactly what, what you would expect. Um, now, if, if you tune the gate voltage, you can also go into regimes where you have both emission at half the Josephson frequency and the Josephson frequency. So we need a little bit more analysis to actually um, uh, understand all of this, and I'm not sure we, we do understand all of this, but uh, this is a pretty uh, clear feature that there's a four pi periodic current running in the system. This is very direct measurement. Um, now the, the question you want to answer is whether it can be topological or not. Uh, a sanity check is then to change the detection frequency and actually check that indeed what you think is your Josephson frequency is indeed linear with the voltage. And this you can do uh, very simply. Uh, nowadays you just tune your spectrum analyzer uh, at a slightly different frequency and your cryogenic amplifier has, has a pretty uh, large bandwidth. And if you do that, you see that there's emission only on this line here in red. And there's nothing here along the white lines which, co which are guidelines corresponding to help the Josephson frequency and the Josephson frequency, and, and twice. So you see that uh, this is exactly what you would expect for a conventional system. You may have higher harmonics, uh, and we actually do measure them, but in a conventional system you, you should never uh, see that, and we don't see any trace of it. Now, if, if we go in a topological quantum well, this is much, uh, much messier, as you can see here. But there's a very clear sign that there's emission at half the Josephson frequency. Um, and you can see that in a wide range of gate voltage, and sometimes the emission at half the Josephson frequency is, is much weaker, but at least you see, a, uh, you, you see clear signs of this emission. They more or less follow these lines. Sometimes it, it's broadened, and, and we think we have an explanation for that. Um, but, but at least there's something that tends to show that there's a four pi periodicity in the system. Um, I'll try to come back to that if I have enough time. Um, so now you can pick up a frequency and tune the gate voltage and see whether this four pi periodicity is actually stronger in the quantum spinal regime or not. And this is what is done here. So if I show you this, this is uh, probably not very easy to understand. This is, again, the gate voltage, uh, the DC voltage. And these are the emission lines, and this is the gate voltage. And if I help you a little bit, you see that uh, there's a regime in which for almost all frequencies, you see very clear emission at half the Josephson frequency and nothing elsewhere. So this would be something that you would attribute to a perfect quantum spinal system. Now, in the, what, what you may think is the conduction band, you have the coexistence of the two, while in the, in the valence band, what you would expect to be the valence band, then the, um, the half Josephson frequency is pretty weak and vanishes as soon as you switch on, uh, as you crank up the frequency. So this seems to be pretty consistent with what you would expect for something which goes from uh, valence band to conduction band via something which would be the quantum spinal regime. Okay, so this is a first type of experiment. Uh, before I, I really go into the detail of the analysis and try to explain how we can uh, sort of uh, exclude the fact that these are landau zener transition uh, and so on and so forth, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the second experiment. But for this, I need to... Um, to go a little bit more in detail in, in, the, in, the, um, in the physics of a Josephson junction. So, so far I've told you 
somehow the Josephson junction is governed by two equations. One is d phi dt equals 2 ev over h bar, and one is ic of phi equals something proportional to sine phi, sine phi over 2, and so on and so forth. But uh, this is not a very realistic way of describing the system. One problem is the fact that with these equations, you do not describe the quasi-particle current, and there will not only be Cooper pairs flowing, but also uh, uh, standard electrons, thermally excited, or something like this. Um, they, they, can, they do not describe uh, capacitive couplings between the two electrodes. Don't forget that we are uh, dealing with oscillating currents, and you have two electrodes very close to each other. So you, can, you may have capacitive coupling, which you may want to describe. In our case, it's not that crucial because the electrodes are, are placed laterally, so the capacitive coupling is rather small. But this is something you may want to take into account. But more importantly, all those equations uh, are well suited to describe something where the voltage is a constant. So this is the thing that your, the operator controls in that case. You apply a constant voltage. And experimentally, this is rather hard for several uh, reasons. And the most important one is the fact that the junction, as you, as you see from the IV trace, has a very, uh, is not a linear component like, like an ohmic resistor. It has a changing differential resistance. And very close to, to, um, to the supercurrent branch, the di differential resistance is very, very small. So it's very hard to apply a, 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 a constant voltage onto such a thing. And you may want to describe a situation which is experimentally much easier uh, to realize, which is to apply a constant current. Because in that case, that's fairly easy. You, you put a huge resistor in front of your Josephson junction, you apply a constant voltage, and this drives a constant current through this huge resistor. And whether your junction has a small impedance that changes depending on, on the conditions does not matter. You have a constant current flowing in, in, the, in the device. And the way you can do that is simply, uh, the simplest thing you can do is to use that kind of circuit. And this is called the RSJ model. And uh, in the RSJ model, what, what, you, what, what you do is that you assume that the junction here carries a supercurrent uh, in this branch, and in parallel can carry a quasi-particle current here in that branch, which you describe as a constant resistor. It's not very realistic, but that's actually the only way to, that people know to, to, to describe more or less accurately uh, um, the dynamics of a Josephson junction without entering too many calculations, microscopic details, and so on, and time-dependent time uh, uh, Hamiltonians and things like this. So I, I want to uh, uh, go rapidly through that. So if you derive the equations, that's, that's fairly simple. You have one. Uh, you have the two the Josephson equations. Uh, one of them tells you how the phase varies with the voltage across the junction. And the other one tells you uh, that the current will flow as a supercurrent. But now you have to add another component, which is the normal current. And the normal current you add as V over R. This is a standard resistor. Except that now you can, uh, um, uh, you can relate V to phi. And if you do so, then you see that you have this equation here which is a differential equation on, on phi, given the fact that you apply a constant current. OK? Uh, and now again, all of the information you're looking for is encoded into IC of phi, uh, IS of phi. Um, now if you look carefully at this equation, what does it look like? It's a first order differential equation on phi. So you may uh, consider it to be uh, analogous to the motion of a particle here in uh, a potential well, which looks like the one that is represented here, and it's called the tilted washboard potential. And the uh, components of uh, um, this uh, potential U are given by this equation here, where you see that the drive you apply gives the tilt of this potential. and uh, the current phase relation, IS of phi, will give these wiggles on the potential. And you may say, uh, I disagree. Uh, uh, from Newton's law, you know that uh, uh, there should be a, a second order derivative. The second order derivative would come from the capacitance here, but we've ignored it, which means that we are in a case where there's a huge friction. 
So the particle here moves into this potential well with huge, huge friction, okay? Now how do you understand uh, uh, from this the IV curve? Let, let's, let's, let's move to, uh, first to the IV curve. Uh, the, the first thing you can do is solve this equation. So you can solve it analytically in the case when there is no uh, AC drive and you get to that formula. And you see here now that the way I describe um, uh, the Josephson function has changed. Before I was applying an uh, um, a DC voltage and I was getting an oscillating current. Here I apply a constant DC current and I get an oscillating voltage and what I measure is the average of this oscillating voltage, which, which I write here, okay? Now, once you have the average, you compute this curve, which is, uh, if, you, if you double it here, looks pretty much like what we've seen before. It misses all of the microscopic information, but for the physics itself, it's, it's, it's not so relevant. So you have something that describes somehow your supercurrent branch, and here you go back to a normal regime, okay? Now, if you, do on, if you only look at that, you miss some of the information which is encoded in the dynamics. So let's have a look at how, uh, how it moves. So you have to uh, understand that you have this, uh, um, um, this tilted washboard potential. Uh, if the tilt is not too strong, this means that the particle will be trapped in one of the minima, okay? And uh, in that case, this Josephson equation tells you that uh, if the, phi, the phase is constant, so phi dot is zero, so V is zero. So if the phase is constant, the particle is trapped, there's no voltage. Now, if you tilt more, then at some point the particle will be able to fall. And if the particle falls, then this means the phase increases. If the phase increases, then phi dot is non-zero, which means there's a finite voltage uh, that, that appears. So here, the dynamics is not so interesting, the particle is trapped. But as soon as you have a finite voltage, this means the particle moves. And the way it moves uh, is, is, is represented here. If you're very close here, what do you think will happen if you're very close to the critical current? This means that somehow the particle is very close to being trapped. So it will, uh, it will go very fast when it's, uh, once it's in, uh, in a minima, then it will slow down massively close to a maxima, and it's very close to stopping, but it's not stopping, it continues. So you have something where the voltage is very unharmonic. It's, 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 um, it's zero or almost zero and then it has peaks like this, okay? Now, uh, if you go to much, much higher uh, uh, excitations, then this means the particle does not even see the wiggles. It basically sees a linear slope. And if the particle sees a linear slope, uh, then basically this means you have a very, very small oscillating current. This is your Josephson current, which, which becomes negligible as compared with the, the overall uh, 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 constant current that, that you will recover in that case, and you're almost ohmic. The oscillating part is zero. And this you can see in animation, where you see that here this particle already is gone, while this one has very unharmonic motion, okay? Uh, and this is something that we will uh, use later on. Finally, I told you that we had the Josephson relation that was connecting, connecting the voltage and the frequency of these oscillations. This still holds. But now you have to think that the Josephson frequency of the oscillations is not uh, uh, given by a constant voltage that you would apply because there's none in such uh, a system, but it's given by the average voltage that you can compute uh, with these equations. Okay, is, th is that clear? Are there questions uh, up, up to here? Yeah? Yeah. Well, if the gap is not, is, is not very strong, then you may have thermal carriers that are excited above, above the gap in the continuum. Um, yeah, Let, let's, let's do it this way. Okay, now I, I gave you this model to go towards the, the other type of measurements. So all of this explanation I could have used previously to talk about the emission measurements, but it's not necessary. The reason why I want to do that is to introduce the, the Shapiro steps, uh, where I told you you combine the internal oscillations 
with an external excitation. Uh, this means that now you do not only have a DC uh, uh, component to the current, but an oscillating one, which means that now you have to think that your potential will not only be tilted, but will oscillate over time. And in that case, what you can do, what you can easily imagine is that uh, you can synchronize the motion of this particle with the excitation. So typically, uh, let's take the simplest example. You lower the potential, then the particle falls to the next minimum, and you trap it again. And if you do that like this, constantly, then the particle will go from one minimum to the next one for every period of the external excitation. And this tells you that, uh, on average, you will have uh, um, an increment of 2 pi on the phase for every value of, uh, for, for every uh, a period, so 1 over f. And if you use this equation, then you see that this gives rise to a voltage that is quantized. Okay? And these are called the Shapiro steps. And they are well known since, I don't know when, uh, and they are actually used right now to, to make voltage standards. So that's, that's the basic ingredient for voltage standards based on Josephson junctions. Uh, now the reason why I tell you this is that, okay, so this is, this is an example of how it works in practice with the, with the simulations from the previous equation. Now the reason I tell you this is now that it's been proposed uh, um, by Hu and Kane to be a good way to, um, to, to isolate this sine phi over two contribution. Because now if you, uh, if you plug not only sine phi but sine phi over two, this means that uh, you will not take two pi but you will take four pi for every period. And this means that the voltage of the Shapiro steps should be doubled, okay? So in principle you should still see steps except that you should miss all the odd ones. So you should only see the even ones. Now, the question is, when I have 2 pi and 4 pi, what happens? Uh, because if you're looking for something that vanishes, but you still have a little bit of 2 pi, then you may still see uh, some of these steps. And when, uh, so I'll show you how we do the experiment. This is, again, a pretty simple experiment. You have uh, a picture of the device. So, so I told you, uh, I, I gave you previously uh, a picture taken with the electron microscope where you, you, you saw a close-up of, of one of these devices. Actually, they come on, on big chips like this, which are, uh, this is about one, cent, uh, yeah, one millimeter here. Um, and you have several devices. And what we do is that just we place a coaxial cable a few millimeters above the chip. And you send an RF excitation in the coaxial cable all the way down to the bottom of the fridge. This is an open-ended coaxial, so you've just cut the coaxial, and this will just irradiate as an antenna. And this is enough to uh, induce these Shapiro steps by inducing uh, an oscillating current in the circuit. So that's a very simple way to do such experiments. Uh, and with such a coaxial cable, you have access to a very wide range uh, of frequencies. So this is fairly convenient. Now if we do the experiment, uh, these are... Uh, uh, data points taken at different frequencies, you see that now the IV curve has changed massively. Instead of having one supercurrent branch, I have now voltage steps that are here and there. And you can plot them in normalized uh, value of, of the uh, quantum you expect, which would be HF over 2E given by the frequency. So these this, uh, voltage steps have different steps depending on the frequency at which you excite. But if you normalize them, you see that all of them fall perfectly on, on these lines here, which uh, are integer multiples of HF over 2E. Now, if you look at very high frequencies here, you see that you see all the steps here, 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 here. You even see half integer steps, which I will not comment, which is something that is uh, seen in many systems and comes from nonlinearities. Uh, but, but it's not so interesting here because you see all the steps, which is exactly the conventional Josephson effect. But what, what is interesting is as you lower this excitation frequency, then you start to see that steps start to vanish. Here you have the first step that is gone, the third step is gone also, but the, f the fifth is still there. And if you lower the frequency even more, then you see that first, third, fifth, seventh, and even ninth are, are gone. 
So now you, 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 you recover this even uh, sequence of Shapiro steps. And you can uh, plot this in a more explicit way. If you now plot the histogram of the voltage values, so you count how many data points you have in a given voltage window, and you get uh, such plots here uh, as a function of, of the voltage here for a, a given frequency pretty high, you have peaks that symbolize that, that represent the Shapiro steps and you see that you have one peak for every integer value and you have these half integer steps in between. But as you lower the frequency, you see that more and more of the even step tend to be missing. So at some point, you see that the steps are not very well resolved. Uh, this comes from two reasons. First, the steps, as I told you, are HF over 2E. So if you lower the frequency, the amplitude of the step decreases but they not, do not only decrease this way, but they also shrink in this direction. So it becomes harder and harder to distinguish them. They become very, very smooth. And this limits us to uh, about 800 megahertz or maybe 500 in, in the best case. Okay. Um, so now I'm gonna skip this also. Now I would like you to understand why uh, how we can understand the frequency dependence of, of, this, uh, of these things. I told you the Shapiro step tend to vanish um, um, as we lower, lower the frequency, but I have not pointed, out, uh, pointed this out previously, but also on the emission features, if you look carefully, you see the, f the, the emission at half the Josephson frequency more strongly at low frequencies. And this is something that was very, very puzzling at the beginning, but now we found a reasonable explanation, which is based on this very simple description, the RSJ description, and is the following. Uh, so we've seen previously that um, um, for very, very high currents, which also correspond to very, very high uh, voltages, but also to very, very high frequencies, given the Josephson uh, uh, relation, then the particle has almost sinusoidal uh, oscillating current and falls almost linearly here. And it falls very, very fast, and the wiggles are very small, which means that somehow whatever you have as wiggles, if they are 2 pi or 4 pi periodic, you do not see any difference. So this is pretty normal that at high frequencies, you do not see a very clear difference between a 2 pi periodic and a 4 pi periodic system. And this means that if you have slightly more 2 pi periodicity or, 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 or something like this, this 2 pi periodicity will always dominate. Here, uh, in contrast, the particle slows down massively when it approaches this point. And this means that if you have some overall 2 pi periodicity, you have to imagine that you have a 2 pi periodic potential, and on top of this you have very small 4 pi periodic modulations. This means that some of the maxima are actually a bit lower, some are a bit higher. Okay? And now because you slow down massively, very close to the maxima, you will be much more sensitive to the fact that you've lowered a little bit the maximum of you of, or you've uh, increased it a little bit. And now you understand that at low frequency with this nonlinearity in the Josephson equation, you be become much more sensitive to this 4 pi periodicity. And you can actually simulate this. Here, if you put no 4 pi periodicity, then you have one, you go from one minimum to the other. And in the very same conditions, but a little bit more of uh, 4 pi periodicity, you see that you go from this guy to this guy. So you always jump from one minimum to the uh, second nearest neighbor. And this is uh, taking an increment of 4 pi in the phase, which means that you've missed uh, a step. Okay? And this is a very simple explanation which explains why at low frequency uh, uh, there tends to be uh, a, a stronger 4 pi periodicity in the system. Okay. Now it also tells you two more things. The first thing is non-adiabaticity um, uh, non non and landau transitions. Um, non-adiabaticity naturally will be something that is more uh, pregnant at, at very high frequencies, okay? Because it's non-adiabatic character, the faster you drive, the, the, uh, the higher the transition probability. Here it's doing the opposite. So it tends to rule out the fact that you have landau in a transition mechanism. And uh, it only tends to rule out, but you can try to use the lowest frequency 
uh, you've measured, you're able to measure, this tells you that already at this frequency, if this was lambda or zener driven, then this means that the gap is sufficiently small for, uh, for, for having very strong lambda or zener transitions. And this will give you a bound, an upper bound on, on the gap, uh, on the avoided crossing if it, if it exists between the bound states. And if we do that, we find a few microvolts which are reasonably small in comparison with, uh, with the energy scales which are the induced gap in the system on the order of, of 70 or 100 microvolts. So this means that if there's a small gap, it's, if there's a small gap, it's still reasonably small. It doesn't mean there's perfect gapless state, but it at least means that the gap is rather small. The second thing you can do is uh, you can look at the crossover between these two regimes. Here I was pretty vague and did not tell you what governs uh, um, the transition between this, uh, this, these two regimes. And uh, I told you that there's a uh, typical energy scale which is the Josephson frequency which is 2 EV over H and V in this system is on, is the, the typical scale is R times IC, okay? And if you, uh, um, if you compute this, this will be typically 70 gigahertz, okay? Here we look at much, much uh, uh, smaller uh, frequencies. So this is not the correct energy scale. Moreover, it doesn't tell you anything about the 4 pi periodicity. But there's another uh, frequency scale you can construct here in the same way, which we call F4 pi, which is 2 E R I4 pi over H. And actually, if you run the simulations and if you, if you call your, your, your theorist friend, he will compute that and he will actually show you that this is indeed the correct scale. Um, and this is all uh, uh, summed up in these papers. And this is a good thing because you measure experimentally this crossover, so you know from this, you can try to extract how much 4 pi periodic supercurrent runs in the system. And you know how many 4 pi peri periodic modes you should have in the system. So you can actually uh, try to uh, um, extract how many modes are topological or not. And if you find 100, then you're obviously wrong because you should only have one, at least one on each side. And if we do that, we find something like one, two, three modes. It's a very rough estimate, so I certainly don't want to claim that this is accurate uh, because there are many, many uh, parameters like induced gap and so on, which we can try to estimate, but, but uh, this, is, this is pretty hard. Um, now, one thing you can do uh, is try to simulate, use these models to simulate the Shapiro steps or the emission uh, measurements. And this is what we've done here together with Fernando Dominguez and Evelina Ankiewicz, uh, where you have in red our data. We've tried to reproduce the IV curve with the RSJ model. And we, we get that type of shape here. And we can compute uh, the emission spectrum and try to see how, how much uh, 4 pi periodicity we need to recover the same emission spectrum as, uh, as we measured. And this looks more or less okay, qualitatively okay, meaning that at a high, uh, at low frequency, the 4 pi periodicity dominates. You have this line, but you see nothing on this line. But if you increase the frequency, then you see that uh, the 4 pi periodicity tends to vanish while the 2 pi periodicity recovers, okay? Um, so I've, I've, I've given you a few examples of, of uh, uh, I've given you two examples of way to probe the 4 pi periodicity. Now we should try to uh, summarize this on a graph uh, which compares these uh, different ranges we see uh, together with the IC and RN and see whether we match these features. We can, we can uh, relate these features to the, to the quantum spinal gap. And what we see is not completely understood. Uh, we see that first, the 4 pi periodicity or the uh, uh, half Josephson emission uh, tend to be in very good agreement. They are seen uh, in, in almost the same, uh, the, the same um, range. Um, they are strongest here, which is fairly close to where you would expect 
to, to where you see the maximum, so to where you, you see the quantum spinal uh, regime, but you see that here, this maximum here, uh, tends, to be, tends to not show anything interesting. And this is still a puzzle. Uh, we, have, um, we have thought about this. Uh, one explanation is the fact that this is a measure, uh, the, the normal state resistance is given by a two-point measurement, meaning uh, that you, you, can, you, you measure the resistance not only of the channel, but also of the, of the, of the contact, okay? And since you, you gate the system, you will go from something which is usually N-doped, slightly N-doped below the contacts, to a region that can be P-doped. And then you build P-N junctions. And these P-N junctions can contribute to the overall resistance and may uh, shift here uh, a little bit this maximum because you should, you, you, you have like a peak for the quantum spin regime, but on top of this you had a contribution that increases as you go towards the P regime. So this could shift slightly um, um, this resistance. This one explanation, um, we have others, but, but I don't want to enter in details. But that's one of the puzzles we, we need to solve so far. Um, now I have a few more minutes, but maybe, it's, maybe I will just uh, um, um, try to explain what, what could be done in the future. And uh, I know that people in the audience, like Raphael, work a little bit on this. Um, so far, I've, I've shown you how you can study uh, Josephson junctions by focusing on its dynamic. And you measure um, uh, consequences of the Josephson equation, so consequences of this 4 pi periodicity, directly by looking at how the Josephson current flows. But what you would like to do in an ideal world is not only measure the consequences, but directly probe these Andreev bound states. And, uh, uh, there are ways to do that, which are technically challenging, which is why uh, uh, we have a hard time trying to do that. Um, but this has been done in, in Saclay in the past, and they, there are two ways to probe, um, to, to probe directly, the, to, 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 to realize the spectroscopy directly of the Andreev bound state. And one of, the, of them is fairly easy in principle. It's just uh, uh, you do um, absorption spectroscopy. So you send photons at a, uh, at a given frequency and you look whether uh, for a given phase you have absorption or not. And if the photon is absorbed, then this means you've excited this transition. And this would be very nice to evidence, uh, to, 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 to get directly the dispersion of these Andreev bound states and show that maybe one of them is gapless. But there are a few tricks. One of them is, I told you there's no spin degeneracy, so the two Andreev bound states have different parity, and the photon does not change parity. So this transition is forbidden in a topological system. It's not in a conventional system where you have the spin degeneracy, but it is in, in, uh, in this system. So this means that you need to find other transition, like from this guy to the continuum and so on. But this is one direction. Um, other directions are to now probe SN junctions. So here we've done SNS or STIS junctions, so Josephson junctions. Now you, we want to go slowly towards uh, SN junctions and, and do similar uh, things as, as uh, similar to what Delft has done, where they studied SN junctions on nanowires. Um, so this is one thing we want to do. Yeah, I'm concluding. Um, and other, other, other directions also include trying to look at the superconductivity in other mercury telluride systems. I, I spent half an hour this morning trying to show you uh, what type of different phases you can realize in mercury telluride. Um, and this would be very interesting to, to combine superconductors with such phases. So we've studied today quantum spinol effect, but uh, there's a possibility to realize quantum all, quantum anomalous hole, or vial physics, but also nanowires. You see here a sketch of one nanowire, which is connected with uh, superconducting electrodes and you see that there's a small cur supercurrent uh, occurring. So there's plenty of things to be done. Uh, if you don't know what to do in the next five years, there are open positions, so feel free to contact me if you want to go there at some point. And with this, I thank you for your attention.